the second installment of the AMSNY Diversity in Medicine webinar series. Um, again, this is a webinar series for AMSNY post bac students, alumni, people who have gone on to residency, have practiced, anybody who's welcome has joined, um, but it is exclusive to the AMSNY program. So we're very pleased to be able to offer this to you. And again, because this is for you, the students, we would like to reiterate that if you have any ideas of people you'd like to hear from, perspectives you'd like to hear, um, or people you would like to nominate as presenters, please let us know. Um, I am Jenny Tassler. I am the Director of Policy and Programming at AMSNY. Uh, we're joined from AMSNY by Bertil Badal, our Director of Diversity, and Jonathan Tayen, our COO, and Joe Wiederhorn, who's our CEO, may be joining us shortly. So a few housekeeping notes. Before we get started, uh, we do want to maintain an open and engaging session. So if you can, please keep your camera on. Um, we understand that not everybody can, but especially if you are asking a question, we do ask that you try to keep the camera on so that we can see you and have this be a real dialogue uh, between the students and the participant. However, if you are not speaking, please keep your mute button on to minimize the background noise and the distractions for uh, all the participants. Um, if you have a question for the presenter, you can indicate it by raising your hand in the toolbar, or you can put your question in the chat. Um, if you don't wanna ask your question verbally, if you aren't in a position to talk, that's fine, just let us know. If you are, we will call on you and you are welcome to ask your question then. All right, so let's get started with a little introduction from our speaker, uh, Dr. Ade Obayemi. Dr. Obayemi is a currently a chief resident in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the combined program of New York Presbyterian Columbia Cornell. Originally from Brooklyn, Dr. Obayemi is a graduate of Yale University with bio degrees in biology from and African studies. Dr. Obayemi also worked as a research fellow in South Africa before attending medical school at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Obayemi will be pursuing a fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery at Upstate University in Syracuse. I know we may have some Upstate students on the, on the call, which is great. Um, so that will start in July, right, next year. Very exciting. Um, Dr. Obayami is also passionate about mentoring, travel, sports, and having a good time. So welcome, Dr. Obayami. Thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. One final housekeeping note, this session is being recorded. So if you have any uh, objection to that, please disconnect now. But uh, we would like to make it available to students who are not able to join at this time. So Dr. Obayami, again, thank you for joining us. Um, Please start out by telling us a little bit about yourself uh, and your path to medicine and whatever you'd like to say. Sure. Thank, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky, feel very privileged to kind of have been invited to come speak. And, um, and please, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty informal person. I'm not, very, um, I'm not very formal. So if you have questions, if anyone has questions about anything, um, feel free to, you know, either interrupt me or I guess put it in the chat um, questions or, or raise your hand. I'm more than happy to, to answer. Um, I think it's really, you know, these kinds of events are super important um, just in general, um, not only for mentorship, but also just to kind of get to know about the different avenues and the different paths you can take in medicine. Um, I kind of discovered my field kind of through one of these events as well. So, um, you know, I would encourage you guys to ask questions and um, you know, feel free to, to, to talk as well. Um, I, so my name is Ade, actually it's, uh, it's short for a much longer name, Ade Tokumbo, which is my full first name. My, both my parents are West African, they're Nigerian, um, and so they immigrated to the States in the 70s um, to study. My father's an architect and my mother is a cost engineer, and uh, I was born in New York. So I'm originally, you know, New York, born and raised, bred in Brooklyn, um, and um, didn't really know much about the medical field kind of just um, always had a knack for science and really enjoyed science and did well, um, you know, in, in, in those classes. And um, growing up, my parents were really very hard about, you know, you can do anything you want in life, but if you have an education, you know, that's always the best way to secure, you know, a good future for yourself, a good life for yourself. So they really stressed excellence in school. Um, 
you know, in school I did a lot of other things. I played basketball, I ran track, I, you know, um, did a lot of musical things. So I had a lot of extracurricular, you know, activities I was doing, but I always made sure to, to make sure that my, my, my grades were kind of the first and foremost thing that ended up, you know, kind of being um, on, on my priority list. Um, I ended up um, kind of through research, kind of getting into a, a magnet school um, that was sort of uh, medically science oriented. Um, and I ended up going there for high school. Um, and so I kind of was setting myself up for a medical track um, even early on, but I didn't really know about, um, you know, what the requirements were for medical school or for medicine in general. My parents weren't doctors. I had no one in the country that I knew that was a doctor. Um, so when I got to college, I kind of, you know, I had a pre-med advisor and that person was really not very helpful to be honest with you. Um, and um, I ended up kind of having to kind of figure out what to do and how to kind of make the, create the application I wanted for medical school just from talking to people that had, you know, got, gone to medical school. So I ended up kind of making friends with the pre-medical students and kind of talking with them. Um, in particular, the, the minority students um, that were at Yale um, who, were, who are some of my closest friends. Um, and, you know, through that, I ended up applying to medical school. And um, uh, when I applied, the, the year that I actually got accepted, I, I had in mind that I wanted to take some time off because I, I, um, I really loved traveling and I knew I wanted to travel at least a little bit, um, either before or during medical school. Um, and an opportunity sort of offered itself for me to go to South Africa to work in a, um, in an HIV rehabilitation um, setting in Cape Town. So I ended up getting a scholarship to go and ended up deferring my admission for a year to go to Cape Town for a year, which was fantastic. I would recommend anyone, if you want to go to, to a beautiful country in Africa, South Africa is the most, one of the most beautiful countries in, South, in, in Africa. It's, it's gorgeous. Cape Town is amazing. Um, and I really learned about sort of how a different medical system kind of works outside of the United States. Um, and, that was really eye-opening for me. Um, and throughout my kind of undergraduate training, I kind of thought about what field I wanted to go into. And it was, um, I liked neuroscience a lot. I liked the brain. I liked behavior and thought, things like that. So I did a lot of research in neuroscience. And then when I got to medical school, um, I kind of looked at all these different things. And I really realized I like I liked surgery. I really liked working with my hands. And I guess we can talk about, you know, ENT and otolaryngology in a second. but. Um, you know, through various paths, discovered ENT, and, and that's kind of how I got to where I am now. So in that vein, what sparked your interest in ENT? Since it is a surgical subspecialty, what gave you the exposure or the drive to enter that field as opposed to any other surgical field? Sure, sure. So I didn't really know what ENT surgery was before I started in medical school. Um, ENT stands for ear, nose, throat, ENT, but the, the um, technical term for it is otorhinolaryngology, which is like a very long way of saying oto ears, rhino nose, larynx is the throat. And so it's a way of saying that it's the study of the ears, nose, and throat, and all of that encompasses that within. And so, um, as a medical student, we had to take a, a week of ENT as an elective. And um, as a third year student, I was I had the opportunity to see a lot of really cool surgeries that I didn't know ENTs were the ones that did. So if you have anyone that you ever um, had meet that has a cochlear implant, that was born deaf and has a cochlear implant for hearing, an ENT is a surgeon that places the implant. Um, if you ever knew someone that had a um, surgery where they had to access the base of the skull through very small holes in the nose or in the side of the face, ENT are the ones that do the approaches for those surgeries. Um, ENTs do everything from, you know, working on patients who have like sinus complaints and like, you know, hearing loss from loud noise exposure to people that have the need for huge reconstructions of the face for cancer or for, um, you know, um, rehabilitation for speech or for um, um, tumors at the base of the skull. So it's a very wide, a very widely encompassing field. And I didn't realize that until I was exposed to it as a medical student. Um, and then I saw a really cool surgery when I was a third year where there was someone who had a pituitary tumor, a tumor in the base of the skull. And the neurosurgeon and the ENT took the tumor out together. And the ENT was the one that actually did the approach. They actually approached the tumor through the nose. 
and they use small cameras and small instruments to actually obtain a, a view for the surgeon, the neurosurgeon, to then just kind of shell the tumor out. And it was a combined approach. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. I thought it was just amazing. And it was like, you know, brain surgery, you don't have a single incision on you. You have, you have a packing in your nose and that's it. Um, so that kind of interested me to kind of do more in the ENT and kind of expose myself more. And I did a, a sub-internship my third year. And I just really loved the people. Um, ENTs are really focused on not only surgery, but also quality of life, because we do a lot of non-surgical management of things. So we manage patients that have swallowing disorders, eating disorders, smelling disorders, hearing disorders, things that kind of affect your quality of life, your ability to, to look, you know, to optimize your, your physical appearance, the ability to, um, to smell and taste and swallow and breathe, those kinds of things, I think, you know, we take for granted until they're not working. Um, ENTs are really focused on those on those elements of living. So I really I really was gravitated to that, and that plus the surgical aspect of things really kind of pushed me to that to ENT. I know you mentioned that ENT was an elective for your school. If you're at a school or a program that doesn't do an elective in ENT or any other specialty that you think you might be interested in, as a medical student, are there ways that you'd recommend you find out more about it or get that exposure that you got in that way? Totally, totally. Um, yeah, it's tough because ENT is one of those fields like orthopedics and like, you know, plastics that is, it's relatively small um, and the programs are not too big. Um, and so if you're going to, a, if you're at a school or at an institution where the, there's, there's not as much of an ENT presence, um, the one thing I recommend and the one thing that I've always said to medical students is that, you know, you should find out where the closest institution is to you that has an ENT department and reach out to a faculty member in that department. Someone that's in that department that may be doing some research that you're interested in, maybe you know, has a specialty of focus that you think is interesting, and just email them. You know, a lot of people that work at academics are very open to teaching and very open to getting emails from students. Um, you know, in, in a pre-COVID era, there's always, always a lot of meetings that people can go to. So usually, you know, for the students, it's really, particularly if you get research done in ENT, it's really nice then to be able to present your research either, either as a poster or as a podium presentation at a meeting. And that's how you get to meet everyone else in the field. So, you know, meetings are a real opportunity for students and people that are trainees like myself to really get to know people in the field and really get to kind of get their name out there um, because the field is so small. So those two things, I recommend kind of reaching out to um, members of the faculty that are at an institution close to yours that has an EMT department, but also going to meetings and trying to kind of see who is in the field and, and really get, because also at the meetings you're getting exposed to the different cutting edge research and the, you know, the more pressing and, and sort of contemporary things happening in the field. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Timmy, I believe you had a question if you want to unmute and ask. Yes, I did have a question. Um, thank you for coming here um, and talking to us. But my question is, like, what were the differences in, like, the healthcare systems between Cape Town and the U.S.? Like, were there any pros or cons? Yeah, I saw that question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, um, the system in Cape Town, so there is kind of sort of a public and a private, which is, you know, a lot of the institutions in the U.S., like the, the highest quality research and, and very, very high quality physicians actually stay in the academic institutions. Um, like, you know, like the Columbia's, the Cornell's, the Harvard's, the Penn's, all these, these large upstates, all these large institutions. Whereas in South Africa, it's really much, you know, um, the private institutions that have a lot more clout when it comes to um, garnering the, the most talented physicians. And then when it comes to the, the system itself, like the academic center is sort of a tertiary center, and then there are secondary and primary centers that kind of refer to the academic center. So it's more of a ladder system where you can't really get referred to a high scale center without going first to a secondary center. And then from there, you go to a tertiary center, which is the academic center. So it's kind of like, you know, you can't just show up at the academic hospital and kind of expect to be treated, you, you kind of go through a system. Um, and that's good and bad. I think they kind of, it's a way for, um, you know, patients to be treated at a secondary or primary center that, you know, have, um, that have um, problems that could be treated there and sort of not waste the resources of a tertiary center on sort of a primary center problem. Um, but it also, you know, it kind of, unfortunately, I think opens its way up to like nepotism. So if you know somebody or have resources, you may be able to get 
care faster or at a more expedient um, fashion than if you didn't have resources. So um, it's definitely interesting. You know, the system is, is definitely interesting. And I think one thing I noticed there was that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a very, very large, I mean, in any country, but there's a very large, poor, uh, rich gap. And so, you know, if you have resources and have wealth, then you're going to, you're going to get pretty good and expedient care versus if you don't. Um, and I was working with patients that had HIV and, and sort of advanced AIDS and sort of the, the clinical sequela of that. So it was a chance for me to kind of see how the referral system worked, but also see what, you know, how wide the, the rich poor gap was. Thank you. Colleen, I think you had a question. Hi, good night. So my question pertains to your interest in other fields before your ENT rotation. Yeah. Um, did you have any interests heavily before ENT rotation? Yeah. And so how did that also affect like that research that you got involved with? Because I know like it's better to get involved with research as early as possible, but if yeah. you're applying to a very specialized field, you want to do research in that field. So totally, totally. No, you, I, yeah. yeah, no, mm -hmm. I, I totally, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, so I wanted to go into neurosurgery when I first started medical school. I was like, you know, I was, I, I had met Ben Carson. I had an opportunity to meet Ben Carson because um, he came and talked at, um, at Yale when I was there. And then he, um, you know, I, I met him a couple times after that. And, you know, um, I, I read his books and I was like, you know, I was going to be the, you know, the, the next kind of gifted hands, you know, that was, that was kind of my, I, that was my interest was neurosurgery and neuroscience. And I actually did, I did a, an early research elective in neuroscience and neurosurgery my first year, thinking that I wanted to kind of get involved. And that kind of exposed me to the operating room and, and the cases there. And through that experience, I actually realized that I didn't want to do neurosurgery um, for many reasons. And it's a great field and, and I have many friends who are neurosurgeons, but, um, you know, I kind of realized that I wanted to, I wanted to, have um, a very wide profile of patients that I dealt with, both sick and healthy. And the patients that I saw in the neurosurgery service were mostly sick and, you know, very, very, um, very amazing surgeries, but, you know, very highly morbid surgeries. And so I, I knew that I wanted to have a, a bit more of a, a diverse patient profile. Um, and, um, and I also wanted to work with soft tissues. I, I enjoyed suturing and things like that. So you know, for me, um, I, I knew that was something that I liked having that experience early because I knew that that's what kind of drew me to look for other things. Um, I looked at um, uh, orthopedics for a little bit too. Um, again, another great field. Um, I have many friends that are orthopods. You know, there, there are different kind of things that draw you to different fields. For me, my mentor told me that like, you know, he, he basically told me to look, think about kind of the, maybe the worst or the most like, quote unquote, boring aspect of any field. And if you could see yourself doing that every day, then that was the right field for you. Um, or, you know, if you were, um, you know, think about, you know, the, cause everyone likes the, you know, the very exciting parts of every field, you know, the exciting parts of neurosurgery, the exciting parts of ortho, ENT, but we don't get that every day. Sometimes you get, you know, more, more mundane things. And if you can, if you, if that excites you, that if you enjoy that, and if you enjoy the people that you're working with, and that's a good feel for you. So, um, you know, I think the first thing you want to kind of delineate is surgical or non-surgical, because I think those are different in terms of the training, in terms of what you're doing on a day-to-day basis, in terms of how much you use your hands. Although there are some, um, you know, non-surgical fields that are more procedural. Um, but um, I think that's the first difference you kind of have to think about. And then once you're there, then you think about, okay, do I want to do general surgery? Do I want to do more of a specialty? And I think you can do electives to kind of figure that out. Um, in terms of research, like your other question, I think, yes, it's important to get involved in research early. That being said, any research in medical school is good research. Um, as long as you can articulate the research and kind of present it in a way that makes sense and that you can kind of, you know, see a project out from start to finish. You know, I had a lot of research in different areas of medicine before ENT that I talked about during my interviews for residency. And that makes you, it makes people impressed because you can, articulate a project and you, you know, took a project from start to finish, but it doesn't have to necessarily be in the field that you're applying into. So I think one of the top concerns of pretty much every medical student is the match. And, you know, when you've picked a specialty and you're planning on applying, especially if it's something competitive, what would you say are some of the best things somebody could do to both prepare themselves, but also to stand out? I think, you know, we're moving into a world where interviews are going to be virtual, you know, sub eyes are virtual. How can you 
present yourself in the best way and also get a feel for the program and make sure that it's the right place for you when you're looking at the, the match process. Yeah, I mean, I, I just finished interviewing actually for fellowship um, and, and it was definitely weird on Zoom. It's a definitely a weird, it's a really weird environment. Um, you know, I don't really actually quite know um, in terms of the Zoom question. I think in terms of how you, you know, um, get the best information, I think the best way to know about a program is to talk to the residents that are in that program because, um, you know, we have, everyone's going to have these open houses now that really come and talk to you guys about the program and everyone's going to have the kind of the same, kind of the same things they're going to say, you know, we, our presidents are great, they do, you know, so many cases and, you know, our faculty are world renowned and, you know, everyone's going to say the same stuff, but I think the real way to get a sense about a program is to talk to the people that are, that are just, are, that are about to finish the program, people that are like in the middle of it, because they'll have the most authentic things to say about it. Um, and I think they'll also, you'll also get a vibe as to what kind of residents the program attracts. Um, different programs attract different types of residents, like a program that's in New York may attract a different type of resident than a program that's in the middle of, you know, Iowa or, you know, Minnesota because of just the, the differences in location in terms of, you know, um, in terms of the lifestyle, in terms of, you know, sort of the, the, the patient pathology um, is different. So I think that ultimately the best way to, to know is to ask the residents. So find out who a resident is and just email them. You know, I think a lot of the residents are going to be on these, on these um, virtual open houses. So get their contact information and just send them an email um, and ask, hey, you know, would you mind talking about your experience? That's actually the best way. And actually they, a lot of the residents also will re report that back to their program directors. And so that's a way for you to stand out. You know, if you've reached out to somebody, um, cause I think it's really, it's really hard to stand out on zoom. I think if we're just, cause everyone's kind of on the chat and you know, people are muted and I think it's difficult to stand out. But if you actually take the initiative and reach out to a resident, I think that's actually, that's actually a good thing and stands out. What were some of the things that drew you to Columbia Cornell? I mean, it's, it's an interesting program cause it's a combined academic program, right. but what, you know, you were coming from, you know, not one of those medical schools. What drew you right. to the program? What made you rank it? Right, right. So um, the ranking process is also, you know, as someone who doesn't have, like, so I'm the, I'm the first doctor in my family here, and then my sister actually just matched in general surgeries, and she just started her residency. So we're both kind of, we were both kind of figuring it out. And, you know, you describe the match to anybody else that's not medicine, it sounds insane. You know, you're like, oh, you just interview and then you rank programs and the programs rank you and you know for me I knew that I wanted I wanted the most um, diverse training possible I, I, I really think that diversity in training and anything really is the best way to kind of develop yourself so I knew I didn't want to stay in my home institutions I knew that I wanted to kind of move around and get a different experience um, I'm from New York so it was that was a plus because I, I know this as well um, and then this program is actually particularly unique because it's like Jenny was saying, there's two campuses. Um, so we are actually full residents at Columbia, as well as Cornell hospitals in New York City. And then we also do rotations at other hospitals as well. Sloan Kettering, which is a cancer center in New York. And then we also do other rotations in throughout the city in the VA system, Veterans Affairs hospital system, as well as in the Bronx. So it's a pretty widely ranged, you know, uh, program. The faculty here have trained all over the country. So one thing you also want to know when you're thinking about where you're going to go is, you know, did everyone that I'm going to be learning from train in the same place? Because if that's the case, they're going to teach you exactly how they were trained and that's from the same place that you are, you're at or from the same place that they train. So you kind of want to learn, particularly in surgery, how to do things different ways based on how people train. And so, you know, um, from my experience, you know, I've learned how to do many things, many different ways because people that I've learned from have trained in different places. So you kind of have, you bring a, a very sort of broad perspective to things when you go to a place where there's a wide number of faculty who've trained in different places. And that's what I found here. Um, the residents here are awesome. Um, we're, they're, we're very fun. Um, you know, I think we're all pretty outgoing. You know, this, we're kind of like, we're city people. You know, we like to be out in the city. We, you know, when we're not at work, we go to Central Park, we, you know, we hang out together. Um, it's a pretty diverse 
in terms of in terms of ethnicity, but also in terms of um, you know life experience. Like, I mean, we have it's about with twenty residents in the program, half half a woman. Um, we have I mean, in my class alone is myself. There's um, an Indian male, there's a white woman, and there is a, a white male. So you know we're we're all very ethnically diverse, but also from different parts of the country, from California, from Seattle, from, Pe from Pennsylvania, from New York. And, and then um, two of us have kids, two of us are single. So it's a very diverse type of residency program, which I liked, you know, that's one thing that I was important to me. Um, you kind of have to think about what's important to you in the resident makeup. You know, if you have a family and you want to be with residents that all have a family, because then you can have, you know, you can go and, and have, you know, um, picnic dates with your kids. And, you know, that, that's something that you can do. And I think that there are a lot of programs that have that kind of culture. Um, so I, I knew I didn't want that, but there's definitely programs like that. So that's why New York kind of attracted me in sort of bigger cities. Uh, Dominique, I think you had a question in the chat. Um, I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on step one, moving to pass fail, and how you think that's gonna affect um, people applying into residency, um, and especially like for students of color too. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. And I was just talking to a mentor of mine about this and, and uh, I do some work with um, a group that uh, one of my, my friends who's now an attending in, hospital, in internal medicine, we started a group um, called the Black Latino Men in Medicine, which is sort of an advocacy mentorship group for Black Latino men at Cornell who want to go into residency um, and also undergraduates that want to go to the medical school. And it's definitely, you know, there's definitely a lot of data about you know, the, the low predicted, predicted value of these tests in regards to success, in regards to academic achievement. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of studies talking about how these tests are, can be biased against certain groups. Um, you know, and I think that the idea of bringing the tests to be pass fail is trying to kind of rectify that inherent institutional bias. You know, I think that there is, there's definitely nuance to it because programs like ENT are so, it, it's not competitive because, you know, you need to be super smart to get into ENT. It's competitive because there are fewer, there are fewer spots. And so there are fewer spots and there are a lot of people, you get a bottleneck effect. And so you end up having to do certain things to screen um, applicants. And so when you don't have step one as that thing, you know, I'm not sure what's going to be that thing. I think there's going to be, what, what I hope will happen is that there's going to be more emphasis on clinical experiences, recommendation letters, research, um, you know, things that are more nuanced and, you know, less like, you know, one day I had a bad day, I didn't pull in the test, but I'm actually a great applicant, but I don't get seen because, you know, I, I didn't have a step one score that was adequate. I think that's, that's the goal. The goal is to, have, is to encourage a more holistic um, evaluation. What I fear would hap will happen is that people will then just go to step two or go to, you know, or go to, um, um, you know, um, um, shelf exam scores. Um, I don't think that will happen, but I think there's going to be a kind of a, a tension for the first couple of years as to what we're going to use to screen applicants. I think what should happen is that there should be more of an, you know, more of a effort to be made to like holistically evaluate the applicant. Um, and you know, that we'll have to kind of, we'll have to kind of see what happens because I think that with ENT, a lot of people apply and there are fewer spots. So what, what I think will happen is that there's going to be a push to kind of change how we, how we screen. And then there's going to be a question, okay, how should we screen? And then people will kind of come up with this sort of more nuanced way of screening applicants than just a simple score. Um, but that's all I can kind of say. I don't really know. Hopefully, I think, I, I, what I hope to have happen is that there will be more of an opportunity for, for people that may not have been seen because of a bad day on test um, that have great applications to be seen and to be interviewed. I think Joe had a question. Joe, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much. I was just wondering if you personally interview residents, prospective residents, and if so, what is it that you're looking for when you interview them? Um, yes, yeah, so I actually am on the on the residents, resident interview committee, and there are two residents that are selected every year to interview, um, and I, I, I love interviewing, so I, I've done it the last few years, and um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question because I think that the, 
what the faculty look for and what the residents look for are slightly different. Um, you know, as a resident, um, you know, you're there primarily to help the service run and to learn, you know, to learn how to become a surgeon, particularly for ENT and for any surgical field, surgical residency. Surgical residencies are a bit different than medical residencies, so I'll, I can only talk to the surgical residencies, but, you know, the surgical residencies, um, at least, you know, ENT-wise and, and I'm sure others as well, um, you know, you have to be a hard worker um, and you have to be a team player. There's, you know, there are, we, I work closely, I work more closely with my co-residents than any, any other people in, you know, in my professional life. Um, so you have to be a team player. You have to be very willing to um, understand what role you bring to the team and to, to and take on that role and to you take on that role fiercely and do it well. Um, you know, for me, I think looking for, you know, hard workers, people that are able to, you know, take tasks to completion, um, people that are self-motivated, um, people that will also be able to, you know, I think it's kind of, it, maybe it's a bit trite to say, people that are going to be able to be teachable. So there are certain people that I think, you know, they're very smart, um, but it, as a resident, you have to be able to take instruction and kind of, inter and, and kind of internalize it and, 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 do, and do it. Um, and I think that sometimes some people can be very intelligent and very, and very ambitious, but not quite as teachable um, because of personality, you know, elements or whatnot. So I think that's one thing I look for too, just people that are open to instruction, people that are hardworking, um, and people that are team players. So um, I have a follow-up. So you said there's a difference between what residents look for and what faculty look for. So what do you think faculty uh, look for in residents? Um, I think faculty look for kind of the, what you would expect, people that have a, a, um, a, you know, a, a history of academic excellence, people that have um, uh, good letters of recommendation, um, that have done well in the medical school, people that express interest in ENT, that, maybe have done research in the field. Um, I think they're, the faculty you interview, they're kind of more traditionally looking for, you know, uh, fact applicants that have a strong academic pedigree. Um, and I think that's, to be honest with you, most of the people that we interview are so academically excellent that they're gonna have that anyway. Uh -huh. So as a, as a resident interviewer, I just don't spend my time on that. I, I kind of look for the things that are practically gonna make you a good resident. Uh -huh. So you know, being a hard worker, being a normal person, someone that can just have a conversation, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you get into a room and people can be a little bit, a little stiff. And, I, res, and interviews are stressful, you know, they're very stressful. I would definitely encourage you guys to practice on, with someone, with a friend, with a mentor, practice how you're gonna respond to certain questions. There are certain questions that are pretty typical for interviewees, you know, um, describe a challenge in your life, you know, tell me about yourself, those kinds of general questions practice how you're going to respond to those questions um, um, and kind of just try and, and be as conversational as you can because I think that's also important uh, particularly among ENTs. ENTs are pretty we're pretty um, we're pretty social as, as, as terms of as surgeons go you know because we also see patients in clinics so we we're pretty conversational. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times the importance of a mentor and how your mentor encouraged you uh, when you were thinking about specialties. How do you both find a mentor, a mentor who's a good mentor? I've heard some, some stories about bad mentors. And what would you recommend for somebody who's looking for a mentor, where, where to go, what to look for, anything like that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think mentorship is, is critical. Um, particularly in medicine, because there are so many kind of roads to navigate, and you're not the first person to have done this. Um, what you what you guys are about to do, so um, and it's a long it's a long path. You know, you're you know you're you're studying for years, you're training for years, and you have to kind of think about where you want to end up. And I think it it really helps to have someone to help you put things in perspective. Someone who's been where you're at and can look for maybe 10, 15, 20 years ahead. Um, and give you a perspective. Now, what kind of perspective they give you depends on what kind of mentor it is, right? So, um, you know, I have mentors for different things. I have mentors for like academic stuff, like research mentors. I have mentors um, for, um, you know, 
for like life, just mentors that kind of talk about, you know, they kind of give me perspective on how to do things in regards to picking a fellowship and like, you know, getting a career started. Um, for me, you know, I thought it was really important to try and have mentors that understood what it was like to be me. Um, and I think that's hard in some cases for underrepresented um, physicians, you know, and as a medical student, we had, my medical school, we had, I think, two um, black surgeons at my medical school. Um, and, you know, one of them was a mentor of mine, actually wrote me a letter of recommendation for residency. And I, I really, I, I, I um, took a liking to him and we kind of became, you know, he became a mentor of mine. And I, I definitely expressed to him that I wanted to try and find mentors that kind of had my priorities in regards to what I wanted to do. So part of a large part of my passion is mentorship, but also like, you know, community service and figuring out a way to integrate my interest in community service into my career and, and how to do that and how to, how to reconcile, you know, ENT with, you know, that interest. And so I wanted to find people that also have that interest and, and do community service and do things that I want to do. Um, you know, I have a mentor for global health as well because I'm interested in global health stuff. So I think it's important to find mentors that have interests that you have, but also mentors that kind of are in a life that you maybe, uh, not that you want, but are, are, are living in a way that, are living in a life that you can see for yourself and try and figure out how they got there and how, and how, and how to try to help you get to where they are. Um, and I think that's, it can be tough. It can be tough for people that, you know, are underrepresented in medicine. Um, so I would say the, the biggest thing I would I would try and have you do is, you know, again, in a pre-COVID or hopefully post-COVID era, try and go to as many meetings as you can, really get to meet people in the fields you're, you're with, see who is there in the room. And then whoever gives a talk, whoever gives a, you know, a lecture, um, don't be afraid to introduce yourself, you know, bring cards with you. I always have cards on me, just like, just in case, you know, I meet someone that I want to give my contact information to. So just, you know, hey, take my card. I would love to, to chat offline, um, you know, to anyone that you find interesting. I've definitely met people at meetings that I've developed in relationships with as well um, through, you know, just through giving me my contact information. So um, it's definitely hard, but I, I would say it's critical to have at least one or two mentors just to kind of be able, especially when you're applying to residency, just to have that. Um, when I was applying to residency, I had a mentor at, I just talked to him about like, you know, whether or not I should take a year off or not to do research and we were just going back and forth about that. And I decided not to take a year off ultimately because I, I wanted to go straight through and, you know, we had a discussion about it and, and kind of how to optimize my application and stuff. So it definitely helps and, it, you know, you don't, you don't want to be doing this alone. Thank you. Jerlyn, you had a question? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, the question that I had is mostly about the challenges that you have faced as a minority in yeah. medicine because yeah. like you said there was only two other people <laughs> that yeah, were yeah yeah so. no, it's, it's definitely challenging no it's a good question it's definitely challenging i mean just just little things you know um um actually we, we held a session a couple nights ago on um, microaggressions in medicine and just talking about experiences um you know just last week i mean the things that kind of you have to kind of stomach sometimes you know um there was a patient that i operated on that i I'd gone to see afterwards um, to check how he was doing. And he didn't remember me because he was still kind of under anesthesia. Um, and, you know, he was talking to his wife on the phone. And I, I said, hi, Sarah. I was in your surgery. Everything went well. And we were kind of just talking. And then I was leaving the room. His wife asked him, oh, is that your nurse? And he says, oh, yeah, it's the nurse. And as I was closing the door, you know. And, and this was last week. You know? And, you know, those kinds of things, you... you it's hard enough being in a position and kind of having to go through residency, but then also kind of having to, to figure out how you handle situations like that emotionally. It can be a little taxing for you. Um, I think that being in a place and in a field where there's not a lot of mentors that look like you also can be taxing, um, but you have to kind of find those communities. And it, it's kind of, unfortunately, it, it is up to us to seek those out, you know, because um, there are communities that exist. Um, that are, are for us, um, but it can be very challenging. Um, I would say sometimes it can be challenging just being the only person in the room and, and feeling like you have to be the spokesperson for that, for your, for your, for your, um, for your cohort or for your, you know, for your, as a minority, it feels a little bit awkward to be that person sometimes. Um, 
So yeah, I think a lot of the existential things that we all deal with as minorities in some way, whether you're a woman or you know an underrepresented ethnic minority or any minority, um, members of the LGBT community, any minority kind of feel at, at certain points. Um, but uh, yeah, those are, those are the challenges and you, you never stop feeling them. I think you always kind of, you, you, just, you evolve how you respond to them um, and how you manage and how you kind of um, support others that are going through the same thing. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, in terms of like the communities, um, what if there's no such community where you, like in the specialty that you choose, how do you create a space that is, that is not there? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely hard. I mean, I, my mentor, one of my mentors when I was, um, when I matched to ENT, I mean, ENT as a field is not a very diverse field, but, um, he, you know, she told me, she's like, you know, day you're going to a field where you're going to be the only person you realize that, right? And I, and I said, yeah, you know, I, I know. Um, and, and I got to Columbia Cornell. And actually, one of the reasons why I chose my program is because my chairman at, at Cornell is, incredi is an incredible champion of diversity. Um, and Dr. Dr. Mike, Michael Stewart, he's great. And actually, both of our chairmen are, are very good in regards to that. And I think that, um, you know, they really supported me. I mean, I... I um, I, when I was a second year student, I kind of, I made it a point to um, create a policy amongst the interviewers that were interviewing amongst the faculty. They, all, of the, all of them did um, online and put some bias training. I, I, had, I like basically, um, you know, kind of mandated, informally mandated all of them to do it and like kind of, you know, sort of approach the faculty and said, this is something we need to do. And they were all supportive of it. And I think you can kind of find champions that are not necessarily of your same race or gender that can be a champion for, for what you believe in. And then also looking outside of your department. So I found, you know, my buddy who ended up being started this group together, he's in medicine, internal medicine. And so we found, I found a different avenue to express that, those, those passions of mine to, to find a community and to mentor, but it wasn't in my department, it was outside. So look outside, look, look in the hospital, look in the city you're in. There are all, all kinds of societies that do, um, um, you know, under minority affiliated work and, and are, are designed for that. So um, don't necessarily be discouraged if your career department is not necessarily as diverse as you'd like. I would also say that this group should be also a group where we also have a lot of alumni who have gone on to do different things. If you ever want us to try to find somebody in a specific specialty, we're happy to do so. And we've found that a lot of the post back students have been able to talk to each other about their experiences and what they're going into um, in a way that, you know, maybe that is somebody you can talk to. So keep this group in mind as well when we go through, because you're all going through the same thing in terms of the post back as well. Thank you. Uh, Savannah, I think you had a question. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you touched upon going to South Africa and having an interest in global health. So I was wondering on um, how you plan to integrate that into your career going forward. Sure, sure. Um, so I um, am going into facial plastics and reconstructive surgery. And so I chose that field because um, I really... Within ENT, I, I really liked everything, but I really, I liked the, um, the reconstruction the best. I really enjoyed um, kind of taking something that was, you know, um, maybe after a resection or something that was, you know, um, dismantled and putting it back together. I really, I really enjoyed that sort of creativity and soft tissue aspect of things. Um, that being said, I liked all of ENT. So... Um, there are many people who do um, global health and global surgery within surgery in, in ENT. And so I actually was able to go to Ghana. I've been to Ghana twice in my residency, once my third year, once my fourth year, and do research in ENT. Um, I try and do, do research. One of my faculty, one of my faculty mentors, actually, she is a former Michigan um, resident, and she was she started a program in Ghana looking at airway management for acute airway um, patients. And so we basically started a project that I went over there to, to do as an ENT resident. And so my goal is to try and integrate my global health interest into my career in some fashion. A lot of people, what they do is they end up going over across um, to various parts of the world for a few weeks at a time to either do global missions work or to do system integrations work or things like that. Um, 
that's something that I want to do, something I'm looking into doing um, after I finish my training, but also looking into education. So the training people to, that are on the ground so that, you know, it's not like a system of dependence, but you're training people that are going to be doing the surgeries. Um, a lot of facial plastics guys will go and do trauma cases or congenital, congenital abnormality cases. So cleft lip, cleft palate um, work or um, vascular malformations or any sort of congenital um, things that people are born with, they'll, they'll go and they'll help to teach, you know, different methods of repair and reconstruction and they'll, they'll kind of teach the surgeons on the ground and the people on the ground novel methods. So a lot of the ways you can kind of get involved. Um, I think the biggest challenge with global work is to kind of figure out a way to be helpful without, um, without developing like a system of dependence where you go and then you leave and then nothing happens and, you know, obviously that, that, that whole shebang, so. For Teal, you have a question. Oh, sorry, Savannah, did you have a follow-up? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. I was just going to ask, um, how do you think that doing that global work will help benefit your patients are here in the U.S.? Great question. Uh, I think, I think like anything else, you know, the more diverse experiences you have, the better surgeon you are. So, um, you know, seeing the way people do things in other parts of the world, I think is really helpful to you as a surgeon, because you can also take some of those skills. A, a lot of, you know, you'll, you'll notice if you ever go and do work abroad, is that a lot of people do things differently in different parts of the world, but it's actually sometimes even better because they have less access to things we have access to here. So not everyone across the world gets a CT scan for everything because, you know, CT scans are expensive. So they'll, they'll, they'll use clinical skills more actually than we will to diagnose certain, certain pathology and they're less inclined to get imaging um, for everything, you know? So I think certain types of clinical acumen actually you probably pick up more in different areas of the world than you do here. Um, so, you know, if you're definitely, if you're interested in global surgery or global health, definitely, you know, ask about that when you apply. I asked about it when I was applying to, um, to residency here. There was a global, there's an exchange program that between uh, France and the U.S. that I also went on my third year. I was in, Paris for a week and I got to just operate in Paris for a week, which was great. Um, and so if you're interested, definitely make that known and so that people can tell you what they offer, you know, for the residents. Okay, Bertil. So I think you've touched on this already uh, a little bit, but I wanted to flip the scenario. So one of the purposes of these webinars is to not just provide information to the students, but um, uh, advice and empowerment. So uh, when they interview, and because it's a two-way interview, right? Um, it's not just the school interviewing you, but it's you interviewing them. Uh, what should they be looking for and asking about? Um, you gave a great example already of how you found out your program directors, I think you said, were champions for diversity. I don't know how you found out about that. Was that during your residency interview? So things like that. Right, right. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I think that um, because you're going to have hopefully several interviews and, you know, it's definitely difficult not to kind of be on autopilot when you're, you know, answering these questions. Um, the, I think the biggest thing, I kind of had two or three things that I knew were important to me that I wanted to ask. So you kind of identify what's important to you, what you want to use. Because like when you're applying, all the programs are going to start blending into each other. They're going to all start signing the same. So you have to make a system. Uh, you have to make a grading system for yourself. And what you and write it down. Like write down. You know, I create. I made like a little like number system, and I kind of like had different categories that I like knew were important to me. So um, for me, you know, having a program that had some sort of template for or some sort of like scaffold for global health or some interest in global work. Was important to me so i asked about that so like, do, do any residents go abroad during the residency and this program they do have residents that go abroad and so I was like, okay that's a check okay do any like what is the and also what's important to me too is where do the residents go after they finish because i wanted to be in a program that not all the residents go to one type of fellowship or not all the residents go to private practice i wanted to be in a program that residents went different places so um, I asked that question, you know, like what kinds of, where the residents typically go, what, what's the typical path of resident after they finish. Um, other issues, yeah, diversity for sure. So, you know, I think diversity can be kind of a, a question that you have to kind of phrase, you have to kind of phrase purposefully. I mean, I did ask about it. I'm trying to remember how I asked about it. Um, 
you know, um, I think you can ask what opportunities are there for residents to get involved in diversity initiatives in the, at the at the institutional level, you know, and if there are opportunities. And actually now, nowadays there are a lot because of, there's been a lot of revamping. There's been a lot of revamping of stuff after, um, you know, a lot of recent events. There's been a lot of, a lot of um, uh, reinvigoration of diversity initiatives at a lot of different institutions. So I would say you can ask about that for sure. And, and if it's important to you, please ask about it because that's the time you're going to get to really, you know, find out what's, what's going on and what, you know, what the 411 really is. Um, so yeah, create a, create a priority system, checklist for yourself, and then like a number system or some sort of grading system. And then after each interview, you know, I, I would do it on my phone. I would just go on my phone and just kind of say, okay, like this program had X, Y, Z, this, this, residents were cool, residents were that cool, blah, blah, blah. You know, so that way I knew that when I was going back, I kind of remembered my notes. Otherwise, it's gonna be hard once you finish all the interviews all the programs start to just like jumble in your mind and it's hard to really know what programs what. And uh, one more point on that, I think probably the types of questions you asked um, your residents interviewees uh, were different than the ones that you asked the faculty, right? Because you, you can get different kinds of answers from them. Right. And you can actually ask the same questions to the faculty and to the residents and see what the differences are. Okay. And that'll tell you if there are, you know, if the residents are thinking the same way the faculty are thinking and, you know, um, definitely, definitely. And then you'll, it's, you'll it's, get the real talk. Exactly. Exactly. There's, there's always some sort of, you know, there's like a, there's like a social event or some sort of lunch as well that happens usually during the day. I guess with Zoom, it's going to be difficult, but like they usually will have like a resident, they'll probably have a resident session, a resident Zoom session. So you'll get to talk to the residents alone without the faculty. And just kind of notice how the residents talk to each other. Like notice if they're like joking, it, it's, it's very it's very easy to tell if the residents are friends, you know. Um, you spend a lot of your time as a resident with your co-residents, a lot. I mean, when you're an intern, you know, as a, as a surgical resident, you're spending at least 75 hours a week, you know, with these people. So it's important to like, you know, to find them, to find them interesting and to, you know, get along with them. So you mentioned the 75 our work week. Yeah. You know, I think one of the, the common preconceptions about surgery is that it is brutal. And I, you know, it sounds like you love what you do. Could you give us the elevator pitch for going into surgery? So get encouraging words to encourage people to consider surgery as a specialty. I mean, surgery is awesome. I don't know. I, <laughs> I think surgery is awesome. I mean, I think I don't know. I, I feel like it's such a privilege. I mean, just to be quite frank with you, like for someone to trust me to, to operate on them, it's a privilege. It's, you know, it's, it's great. You know, I mean, um, I, I think it's, it's so amazing that that amount of respect we get from people in society to be, to be able to, you know, do the things we, we do. Um, obviously, you know, in ENT, one of the great things that's great about ENT is that we actually do both surgery and medicine a little bit. You know, we, we are medical we, we treat things medically. So, um, you know, the people that come in, we don't always operate on everyone that comes in with an ENT problem. Sometimes we do, sometimes we give them medicine, you know, and they get better. We don't have to operate on them, you know, as opposed to say an orthopedic surgeon or a general surgeon, usually they come to the surgeon because they have been worked up and they have a problem and need surgery and then go to the surgeon, you know? Um, we actually, we did get to decide whether or not we're gonna operate. I mean, manage people without operating all the time, um, which is nice. Um, the, you know, the, the, the hours in the early days and stuff, you know, I think, you know, yes, I'm not going to lie. There, there, there are long days in surgery. Um, but I think the, the kind of the, the phrase, the days are years and the years are days are pretty, it's pretty accurate. Like, you know, when you're doing it, like the day can seem long, but you'll realize all of a sudden, wow, it's been like a year, you know, and you won't even, you won't even know. Like, I mean, I've been at, I've been in this program for, this is my fifth year. And I feel like, I remember what it was like being an intern. You know, I remember my intern year very well. So, um, you know, the time flies. And I think that, um, you know, there's so, there's just so much awesomeness is what we get to do. We get to, you know, we take out tumors, we, we restore hearing, we restore smell. We, you know, people come in with congenital anomalies. We fix cleft palates. We, 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 we do, you know, all kinds of stuff um, that 
it's just so it's just so rewarding and it's very immediate satisfaction um i would say there's very few things in the world like it well thank you we're nearing the end of our time so if anybody has any other questions feel free to maybe just unmute and go for it um well, while you were in medical school, outside of research, was there anything else that you kind of got involved in that you feel like um, either made you a better candidate when you were ready to go to residency or just made you a better surgeon? Um, outside of medical school. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I did a lot of work in like SNMA. Do you guys know what SNMA is? Um, I mean, it was that's kind of medical school, but I did a lot of like I was involved in like our regional chapter, and like I always went to the conferences, which were super fun, and like um, gave talks, and and um, so that was kind of a nice way to kind of get to know, honestly, get to know other African American and other minority physicians, but also to kind of create a community for myself, um, and that was great, um, you know. I like to work out and travel. I, I don't know. I did a lot of like, you know, um, I ran like a Tough Mudder and did like, you know, other things. A bunch of our, our classmates did like, we used to like work out together and stuff. So we did a lot of sort of outside of, you know, medical school things for fun, which were great. Um, just to kind of get your mind off of medicine when you're not in the hospital. I don't know how much it helped me for residency, but it was just a nice way to kind of just stay sane, you know. Um, did a lot of that. I, I traveled a good amount um, as well. Uh, I was in Tanzania for a little bit and, um, you know, just I traveled as much as I could. Um, but I think that ultimately, you know, when I was outside the hospital, I kind of tried to, to have a little bit of a healthy work life. Yeah. I mean, it could be like in medical school, but just like outside of um, the research. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, student government was one thing I did a lot of. Yeah. So, SNMA, I was involved in our, um, our um, class council. Um, I did a good amount of things in terms of, um, like, we had, we had community clinics as well. So, um, people could volunteer to work in the community clinics um, in Philadelphia, which I did a lot of that um, related work. Uh, so, you know, disenfra disenfranchised people that wanted free health care, but, you know, didn't have insurance. So, we'd have, like, a medical student and clinic and the faculty would staff the clinic. So there was, there was always someone that was like an MD there, but then the medical students would see the patients and kind of triage them and examine them and stuff. So that was always a really rewarding experience, which I, which I was involved in um, as well. Um, I don't know. I did, I did other things too. I'm just I'm blanking on other things all the time. Um, I think the biggest, the biggest thing I did Honestly, the biggest bit help was just exposing myself to like the clinical environment. So shadowing, um, you know, work like working in the ED. Um, I had a lot of friends who were scribes in the ED. Um, you know, shadowing experiences, kind of just getting to see as much as you possibly could uh, in the clinical setting, just kind of preparing you for the residency. Um, I think that was always always really helpful. Um, yeah, but just those. Like sort of like auxiliary clinical experiences are always really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it, Dr. Obayami, and we hope you, you wish you the best of luck in your fellowship next year. Thank you guys. And Good luck to you guys. You guys will be great. Um, and, and I can leave my email here. Let me just, um, I guess you can see this. Any questions or anything like that, you know, just send me a, shoot me an email. I'm, I'm usually pretty good. If I don't respond in the, you know, two days or so, just send me another one and I'll, I'll, I'll respond. Sometimes it just get, it gets lost in the email list. But um, any questions at all, anything, you know, from, from applying to, to where you want to live to just little things about the match. Um, the match is a very weird process for anyone that's not had done it before. It's super awkward. And, you know, definitely um, you want someone kind of helping you through that as well. And then, you know, um, if you have any questions about like different societies in New York, that I, I'm a part of a couple of societies in New York that are also geared toward um, community for underrepresented minority physicians. Um, so I can help you with people if you need. Um, Anything at all, just, just hit me an email. Thank you again. 
Thank, thank you all for joining us. Again, I'm just going to put in a plug. If there's a topic or a speaker you want to hear from, let us know. You can email myself or Pratil, and we'll be happy to get back to you. So thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. Hope everybody maybe watches the debate, maybe not. Whatever you want. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care.